Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings and welcome to this joint TCMI ACES webinar. I am Anna Baptista, the Chair of TCMI. It is my pleasure today to introduce the joint webinar series and today's presenters and topic. The joint TCMI ACES webinars are presented as a service to members of TCMI and ACES and to guests. The purpose of the joint series is to advance the discourse and practices of innovative metadata. This webinar is presented by Eric Kudumo and Tom Baker, the editors of the Shape Expressions Primer, issued last March. Eric Kudumo is a member of the W3C staff, and Tom Baker is the DCMI assistant director. Eric and Tom are going to present Shapes, a language for representing RDF graph structures. You will have an opportunity to ask the presenters questions near the close of the webinar. There is a panel on the right of your screen to enter the text of your questions. We ask you that you wait to enter your text until near the end of the webinar. I will moderate the questions and answers. We will address as many questions as our time allows. With that, I'll turn the podium over to Eric Prudumo and Tom Baker. Okay, this is Tom. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, okay, so um, if, if any of you in the audience know XML schema, you know that it can be used to validate data. So we have here, um, a, an XML schema on the left, and then you have some XML data, and you prescribe conditions to which an, an XML document must conform to be con considered valid, and then you, you put it through a validator and it yields a validation result. Um, so, um, shape expressions language, or SHEX, is similar to that um, because in this case, you have a, um, it, it prescribes, you have a schema, a Shex schema, uh, which prescribes conditions to which nodes in an RDF graph must be, must conform to be considered valid. So you're validating a graph against a schema to yield a validation result. Or uh, another way to put it is you're validating data against a schema to uh, yield a validation result. So what you see in the upper left here is uh, a Shex schema using something called Shex C syntax for Shex compact syntax. Uh, and its main uh, virtue is that it's easy to read and write, relatively easy to write in, uh, to read and write. Um, and I'm going to be walking through an example, um, this example showing you um, how it works in more detail. Uh, but first, I want to show the two other syntaxes that uh, can be used with Shex. One of them is the Shex um, J syntax. So it's based on um, JSON LD. Uh, JSON is um, easy to generate using algorithms. And you'll notice in this example in the upper left, there is a context which means that the JSON can be interpreted as RDF. So the third syntax for um, a Shex schema is the Shex R syntax, uh, which is the RDF interpretation of, of Shex, Shex J. So you can have um, you can have a Shex uh, schema written in RDF if you want. It's it's not used as much as Shex J and Shex, Shex C, and we're going to focus for the rest of the talk on Shex C. So um, here we have an example of a resource in the RDF data on the right. Um, uh, 
uh, that matches or need, needs to be matched against a uh, a shape uh, which is labeled work on the left hand side of the schema um, before going on I should mention that there is a uh, just mention that there is a pre-processing step that uses the Shex shape map language to associate the um, RDF node on the right with the Shex shape on the left. Um, and um, Eric is going to say a little bit more about these later in the talk. But so we have this data on the right, and we and we have this um, this node in the data which is being matched against the uh, shape on the left, and it has um, the the data um, uh, has an optional RDF type um, bib frame work statement. So you'll see in the data um, it. Uh, it's written RDF type uh, bib frame work, and in the schema, it's written as a pattern to be matched, uh, essentially. You have here um, a the specification that there can optionally be an extra RDF type statement, um, so the corresponding statement in the data is RDF type bib frame text. Um, and it has exactly one bib frame title statement with a literal value. So it's using, on the left hand side, it's using the keyword literal um, to, uh, sh to say that, um, that the value of the, of the triple with um, bib frame title is, is literal. Um, you'll notice that the Shex C syntax is quite similar to the um, to the turtle syntax uh, for RDF on the right. Um, basically, it's turtle syntax with keywords and placeholders um, that uh, indicate. Uh, what patterns need to be expressed, the patterns that need to be matched. Uh, then you have a, um, a pattern on the left which says that it, the data uh, needs to, that a resource matching the work shape um, has zero or more uh, bib frame class statements taking objects that match the classification shape. So it is um, citing the classification um, shape with this um, ampersand uh, symbol, um, or at, at symbol, sorry. Um, and that you have uh, then a, um, uh, a bit of uh, a resource in the RDF data that matches the work shape has one or more bib frame creator statements, taking objects that match either the person shape or the organization shape. And a resource in the RDF data matching the work shape has zero or more bib frame derived from statements, uh, taking an IRI as an object. Okay, so now we're we're looking at a resource matching the classification shape on the left. Um, so um, it is a shape labeled classification, and it is identified with um, a resource that matches this classification shape is identified with an IRI starting with ID. Um, Lock gov, which is the um, the URI base URI for Library of Congress vocabularies, and it has an optional RDF type uh, bib frame uh, LOC uh, statement, 
and optionally has an additional RDF type statement. Has exactly one bib frame label statement with a literal value. And shapes can combine constraints uh, using and or not. So it must uh, meet the condition of having the uh, URL uh, ID lockgov um, and the uh, uh, the second constraint um, following this first constraint. Okay, that just gives you a flavor of um, of what's what's happening. Basically, you're taking a piece of data that's expressed in RDF, and you are abstracting out a schema which expresses the patterns that you expect to find in the data, and you are matching them up um, using a validator, and the validator is providing a response, whether the data uh, matches, the, um, matches the patterns uh, or uh, reporting uh, where the data does not match the patterns. Here are some examples of how it can be used. So there's the Gene Wiki project, which uses bots to sync resources on genes, proteins, drugs, um, diseases. And due to the open nature of Wikidata, um, these things are described by different sets of, of properties. Um, and the role of Shex in this scenario is to communicate the underlying models used by the bots and to capture any errors and, um, and issues and report them to the maintainers. Um, notice that on this slide, uh, there is a try it button. Um, uh, I will not click on it now, but uh, you can click on these uh, when you um, uh, look at the slides, you can click on these buttons. They will take you into a, um, a, a, a demo site and load load the examples um, in a, um, a site where you can where you can um, you can tweak the examples and uh, and get and understand um, how how these um, these structures work. So here's an example of a disease that is described in Wikidata. And it is, um, and here is a screenshot from the uh, online validator, which you can, if you try the try it button, this is what it will take you to this, um, to this screen. And it has a, um, a schema that, defi that defines the shape for references to the disease ontology um, and queries a Sparkle endpoint for the data. Um, and the um, uh, Sparkle query focuses validation on resources with disease ontology IDs and um, it gets validated against this, the data gets validated against the schema, and you have down at the bottom a, um, a validation result which tells you that um, in the item identified with WDQ12206, um, you, have, um, uh, you have a missing property. Uh, that was supposed to be there. So the um, prov was derived from uh, property is missing. Um, so the reference, um, so here is, uh, here is uh, another view of, of the um, 
of the references in Wikidata. The reference is missing on um, a, a mapping to an ID that matches the specified pattern. So this is something that you might want to flag to the data curation team uh, as something which um, should perhaps be added to the disease ontology uh, fixed in Wikidata or um, alternatively, you could change the Shex uh, schema to accept um, data in this form without um, uh, without raising a an error. Okay, another example of Shex being used to validate um, medication requests in the context of a um, uh, a, an initiative called Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, FIRE, um, and for the exchange and integration and sharing of electronic health information. And here we have an example um, of a um, of a um, uh, data on the left and a Shex schema uh, describing the expected patterns in that data on the right. And um, I just put this up to show, you can see that the, um, that the constraints on the data um, can be quite complex. You know, in the case of, of uh, medication requests, uh, the data itself is quite, is quite, um, quite complex. So Shex, um, has the is expressive enough to express uh, the types of validation that um, you might need to do on medication requests. Okay, the state of development. So there are currently um, open source implementations in five programming languages: uh, JavaScript, Scala, Ruby, uh, Java, and Python. And here are some links to the, um, so the JavaScript uh, implementation is really the reference implementation for, uh, for Shex. Um, it currently passes um, over a thousand tests and um, all of the other implementations use the same tests. Um, and um, some of them, and most of them are pretty close to being complete, um, but are, uh, are missing um, work on, on, on Shex is ongoing. So um, the, um, the functionality continues to be developed um, and, um, and the tests uh, along with it. Um, there is, I wanted to mention one development which uh, we think is potentially um, uh, quite, uh, quite interesting, quite important. Um, Jupyter Notebooks, if you don't know them, are used a lot by data scientists. They are a browser-based environment for that. Um, uh, so you work in your browser and you type in some some code and you execute the code and the result of that um, is uh, pasted into your uh, browser into your notebook and you can save that notebook as JSON H HTML LaTeX um, PDF HTML slideshows Markdown um, and it's um, there are, are many programming languages supported in Jupyter Notebook, and um, and we're currently working on the um, uh, uh, on implementing Shex in, in a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, we can we're using the um, Python library and. Um, uh, the goal is to make it to reduce the boilerplate uh, that one needs um, to to execute um, a, a data validation process in a Jupyter notebook using 
um, using the the Python. So um, so this is uh, potentially a very exciting uh, development because the Jupyter notebook is um, uh, can be used to log the process of data exploration and document results. Uh, and it can even be used to um, uh, to author books. And in fact, uh, our sort of medium-term goal is to um, uh, publish the Shex Primer as a Jupyter notebook. And the nice thing about a Jupyter notebook is that it can be you can you can share it um, on GitHub with other people. Other people can download it, and you can and they can um, go into a notebook and change the examples, um, uh, tweak them for their own needs. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a very useful environment for data exploration and documentation. Um, yes, here is an example. Currently, there's a bit of over, over um, of a boilerplate, as one says, um, that uh, importing libraries that are necessary and declaring variables, um, so it's not quite as straightforward as um, uh, as it could be. But this is something we're working on. Um, so before I I pass the baton over to Eric, I should say that um, that really I've covered just about everything uh, you would need to um, if you have simple requirements for. Uh, Validating data. If you have, uh, if you don't have uh, complex requirements like in the medication requests, but if you're, um, if you're really just trying to, to test and make and see if if um, this big set of data that of triples that you have, um, if they are, uh, if they meet the uh, patterns that uh, you expect them to meet and they match. Um, and and if not uh, to report the results, then really um, there's not too much more that you need to understand about checks um, than what I've already covered. Um, and I say this because uh, um, because uh, now Eric is going to do a bit of a deep dive and and talk in a bit more detail about the structure of the language and about some of its more advanced. Um, expressive capabilities. So uh, over to Eric. Uh, do I need to change presenter? Hello, Eric. Oh, hey, I get it. Sorry, um, was muted, wasn't I? All good, start again? Yes. All right, all right, so apologies. So yes, it's time to get geeky, um, and this is a good introduction not only to the, this is, this is a reasonable summary for not only my slides, but me in general. So uh, Tom gave you a an overview of Shex where you got to see some uh, shapes that were made up of triple constraints, each of which needed to be satisfied. And not surprisingly, we call that each of. Uh, so we can say that, for instance, each of uh, somebody needs to have both a family name and a, a given name and a family name. Now, we also have a one of 
So if you want to say effectively or, but it's more exclusive than or. Uh, and in fact, if there are n of them, it's it's exactly the best description of it for it is for it is one of. So what we have here is a user must have either a schema name or a FOV given name and a FOV family name. And so Alice passes because she has a schema name, Alice Jones. Bob passes because he has a FOV given name and a FOV family name. Claire fails because she has a, only a given name. And Dave fails because he's got sort of a mixture of the two where he's got a, a schema name and a FOV family name. And in fact, they even conflict. So this is what the, this gives you the idea of what the one of is. And if you are interested in, uh, if you're looking at this this syntax and you're saying, well, do I need the parentheses around the or? Well, in fact, you don't. Um, it's like most programming languages where the or is has minimal has lowest associativity. And if you were to, to say, well, how would I know that? You could always look at the shex j and say, oh, in my shex j, I've got an ex a sh shape which has uh, an expression which is a one of. And then I've got two branches to the one of. One is a triple constraint on schema name, and another is an each of for both a given name and a family name. So the Shex J reflects the semantics of the Shex C. So here's a quick slide to show you the nesting of all of the different components in Shex and how they how they nest inside each other and how they co-reference, et cetera. Um, I will build up to this gradually. This is mostly here for your uh, reference later on. So a shape expressions or shex schema holds a collection of labeled shape expressions. At the bottom of the page, we see that user is the, sh is the shape expression label. And then there's, in blue, there's a shape, which is the simplest of shape expressions, which is a kind of shape expression. And then inside that shape expression, it has a triple expression. And that triple expression is an each of for schema name, birth date, gender, and nose. If we dig into those triple constraints, we see some node constraints, which are telling us for each one of those properties, name, birthday, gender, and nose, what values it must have. So we have two of them have to be, well, the name has to be a string, birthday has to be an XSD date, the gender has to be either schema male or schema female or an XSD string. So you've got a choice, you can either fit into that value set or you can just supply your own string. And then schema nodes has to be of uh, the node kind IRI. So there are node kinds for blank node, IRI, and literal. And then the at user is not a node constraint, that's actually a reference to another shape, and we'll examine that in a moment. So here we, uh, we see four triple constraints that are combined into an each of that are part of this shape. And then that shape, indeed, in turn, has a label. Looking at the triple constraints on their own, we see there's a, a predicate, uh, which is, uh, for example, in the first one, which is the which is schema name. There's a value constraint, which is the data type in this case must be, have, must be a literal of type uh, XSD uh, string. There's a, an, um, an implicit card cardinality. If you don't include it, um, then the cardinality is assumed to be exactly one. So it means if we don't have that cardinality, we're expecting exactly one schema name with, of type XSD string. We could also say, you know, between two and five names if we wanted to, though typically you stick to the things that you say all the time in regular expression, which are is zero or one, uh, which is question mark, which you can abbreviate question mark, uh, one or more, which you can abbreviate uh, plus, or, and zero or more, which you can abbreviate question, uh, sorry, uh, star. So these are the same the operators that you're used to from regular expressions. So we've rebuilt our terminology overview bit by bit. And again, this is for reference in the future. And the way we've, what we've talked about so far is the structure of the schema. Now we actually have to talk about the parts of the data that we're looking at to measure them against the schema to see if they uh, actually fulfill the constraints in the schema. So we have a notion of at any point when we're validating something, we're examining some node, we call that the focus node, and then that uh, focus node has a neighborhood. In this case, our neighborhood is, we've got a, we've got a big graph here, um, but if we're only looking at, if Alice is our focus node right now, I mean, we, we might be validating everybody in turn, but right now we're validating Alice, colon Alice. We have three triples, 
that are arcs coming from Alice, schema name, schema follows, and schema works for. And then if you scan down, you'll see in blue a couple of incoming triples. Turtle organizes the outgoing triples nicely for us. It makes it easy for us to organize them that way. Turtle doesn't really necessarily cater to organizing the incoming triples, so we have to scan for them. But we see Carol follows Alice, and our company employs Alice. So the neighborhood has five triples. And so what you can think of that is in a large graph, what we're doing is we're just taking the, the triples that touch Alice, the triples with incoming and outgoing arcs that touch Alice. So uh, we have uh, shape maps, which are, uh, there are three kinds of shape maps. If you wanted to say uh, that, because uh, so far, actually, let me backtrack a little bit. We've talked about schemas that have shapes in them, and we've talked about nodes and graphs, and now we actually have to say, uh, what node in what graph do I want to validate as what shape and what schema? And that's where we do, that's what we do with shape maps, is they basically give you a, a tuple of a, a node and a shape. And that's what you need to validate. And then there's also query shape maps, which can be enriched with uh, triple patterns. So if you don't want to say, I want, if you don't want to enumerate all of the triples that you want to validate as, as oh, I'll sorry, all of the nodes that you want to validate as some shape, you can instead create a triple pattern. I'll show you an example of that that gets resolved to a fixed shape map, which is just pairs of node and shape. And then the result has pairs of node and shape, which are adorned by whether or not the, the validation was successful, whether it conformed. So we have this path where we go and take, initially we have a query shape map, which may have node shape pairs in it, but if it has triple expressions in it, it has they have to be resolved to uh, node shape pairs, and so you take the the triple expression and the RDF graph, and then you find all of the things that match it. So, for instance, when we say our focus node at the first one on the on the left, we say the focus node schema works for underbar means we're looking for every focus node where we're examining as the focus node uh, every node which has a schema works for of any value. And then for the second one, we're saying that our focus node is anything which has an RDF type of schema person. So the underbar that we saw in the first one means I don't care what the value is. And then the second one, we said we actually do care about specifically that value. And then the third example in the query map is any, we're taking as a focus node, any object of a works for property. The validation then takes the node shape, the fixed map, which uh, has the node shape pairs, takes the schema, which has the, the shapes in it, and the RDF graph, and then gives you a result shape map. And so in this one, Alice matches user because Alice has a fourth name of Alice, and she knows Carol, and Carol, and it says in our schema that schema knows has to match at user, so we're effectively now validating Carol as a, as a user, and Carol matches because she has a schema name of Carol, and she has no fo so no schema knows properties, so that, which is fine because the min cardinality if it's star is zero. Bob does not match because he doesn't know a person who conforms to a uh, to the user schema. In fact, a user shape. In fact, he knows English, which is probably means that you've got a mistake in your data. So we want to flag that, and then. To the implementations differ on this part. They get to they get to decide whether or not to include the incidental things that they validated. So when we were validating Alice, we also had to validate uh, as as a user. We also had to validate Carol as a user, and so this particular implementation th throws in the fact that Carol also matches matches user, even though she even though Carol was not one of the questions that came in in the original fixed shape map. So the whole validation process takes a schema a query shape map and an RDF graph. And that bundle of things is called a manifest entry. And so we get to throw in manifest entries at each other, both for purposes of doing testing, but also just because uh, like in WSDL or any other system, whenever you want to validate some part of your payload as uh, with respect to some schema, you have to specify what part of the payload it is that you're validating with respect to that schema. And we do that with manifests. 
So we've seen a couple examples of shapes referencing shapes. And uh, for instance, we saw that user had a schema nose of another user. Here we have um, an example where somebody has a biological parent who matches the male shape and another biological parent who matches the female shape. And so we see that we have these, in the schema on the left, we have two S colon parent properties and then references to these named shapes. And that's, if you're not making any other references to the male and female um, shapes there, then there's no, you don't necessarily want to go and make them separate. So instead you can just put them in line uh, and that makes it more compact so you don't have to trip over, um, you don't have to trip over extra stuff when you're trying to read the, you know, trying to write the entire schema on the back of a napkin or something like that. We also have inverse triple constraints. Um, those are triples which are the, uh, we, remember in the, in the, when we were describing the neighborhood, we described other, the neighborhood consists of both outgoing and incoming arcs. And so in this example, if I'm validating or testing the conformance of our company with respect to the company shape, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the company shape and I say, okay, so it needs A or RDF type. A is shortcut, shorthand for RDF type, just like in Turtle Lin and Sparkle. So it has to have a type of schema colon company and the reason that schema colon company is in square brackets with that fixed value is because that's effectively, that's a, that's a very short value set. It's a value set of one. So the way you say that, you, that something has a fixed value is you just give it a value set of one. You could have an, a longer set. You could have, it has to be a company or an organization or an NGO or something like that. But in this case, we just got a value set of one. Then the next triple pattern in our uh, in our schema on the left and our shape for company is starts with a, a carrot. That carrot says that you are now looking for an incoming arc instead of an outgoing arc. So when we say schema, uh, carrot schema works for, that means we're looking for something that comes into our company. Because remember our company is the focus node right now for the purposes of this discussion. And so then we look through our data and we say, okay, Alice schema works for our company and Bob schema works for our company. So now we want to validate, according to the schema on the left again, we want to validate both Alice and Bob as employee. And the additional constraint here, because there's a plus, is that means it's only a valid company if it has one or more employees. But now we're gonna test those, uh, those uh, Alice and Bob against employee and then we look at uh, we look at Alice. We say that she. Uh, that we look and we look at employee. We say employee says you need to have a schema name of an XSD string. We look at Alice. She has a schema name. And if you recall from Turtle, any uh, already have one that one Turtle, any literal that doesn't have a data type on it is XSD string. So Alice here is an XSD string. And then it also has to have a schema colon works for something which conforms to a company. And so then we look at schema colon, we look at Alice and we say schema works for our company. And then if we're not being careful, we'll go back into our company and we'll say, oh, we have to validate that with respect to company. And we end up in a circle because we validate the company. Uh, we check its works for, that includes Alice. Um, and we checked it, its inverse works for ARC. Then that includes Alice. And then we check the outgoing works for ARC and then it goes back to the company and we have a cycle there. So this is well within the expected behavior for Shex. So uh, all of the implementations behave gracefully with this sort of data. In fact, that's sort of one of their core points. Uh, it's easy to build with something that, that gives you cycles and negation. It's easy to build a, what's called a liar's paradox. And so uh, you can create invalid schemas by saying, um, effectively something along the lines of this statement is a lie. But the uh, a, a rather brilliant language designer named Jovka Boneva has laid out carefully with stratified negation exactly what are the criteria for a sound schema and we can all, and we, uh, the implementations can do static 
uh, static analysis in order to figure out whether the questions you're giving the engine to ask are in fact valid questions or whether you're asking it to solve something that's called the layers paradox, in which case it rejects it. So that's the work that's required to make something sound with respect to recursion. And Shex does that quite well. <clears throat> There's another uh, interesting aspect to shapes that's probably worth um, that's that's worth little discussion, and that is closed shapes. Closed shapes are uh, simultaneously an anathema to the RDF model of anybody can say anything about anything, and an obvious and practical uh, requirement for most workflows, for many workflows. So on one side, you've got the anybody can say anything about anything, which constrained, for instance, the development, the, the design of OWL. So for instance, in OWL, if I say something has a minimum cardinality constraint, I can't fail that because OWL will always assume that there's somebody else out there who's made some triple somewhere that, that, can, that fulfills that constraint. Uh, where, you know, like if, I, if I'm supposed to have two biological parents and I tell OWL about one biological parent, it will simply say, okay, uh, I guess maybe there's another one out there. I don't know otherwise, so I'll just assume there is. So you get more validation out of shape expressions, for instance, be, uh, than you get out of OWL because you can actually, it actually closes the world and looks exactly at the data that you're validating in order to tell you whether you've got something that's conformant rather than something that could be theoretically conformant if the right other data comes along. So now in our shape map at the top there, our query map, we're looking for everybody with a schema name, we want to test them, those, them against user, and we're looking for everybody with a, a schema nose, and we want to test them against user. So if we've got an open, uh, if we've got an open shape, then um, everybody, everybody conforms, everybody like Alice, Bob, Dave, and Emily all conform to this shape because they all have uh, they all have the required properties. However, if we look at the on the right side, where it's the same sh the same shape again, but it's closed, then Dave doesn't conform to it because he's got an extra property which is not mentioned in the um, in the schema. So uh, places where you would want to use closed shapes uh, would be if you were say say if uh, well, I guess start out, start out with places you wouldn't want to use closed shapes. If you were, if you have a service where people upload data, and that service is backed by a generic triple store, and it is promises to return all the data that gets stored that people submit to it, then you probably don't need a you don't need a closed shape because the terms of the service are that you can give me any data and I'll accept it and give it back to you when you need it. If, however, like most applications, it's stored in the, the data that somebody is posting to you is then being reflected in a change in application state or maybe going into relational database with a closed content model or something like that, you then need to do take one of two actions. You can either say, when you're posting data to me, I will reject it. If it has anything, I don't recognize it. Or you can say, fine, you can send me whatever. I will quietly reject it. However, I will tell the world about a schema that is closed so that they know before they submit to me, they can test to see what data that I will, I will be able to accept. And so when Dave is sending his, his schema name, schema nose, and link to virus, he will get an error saying, oh, sorry, we can't accept your link to virus. We'll drop it on the floor for you. So he now knows not to submit that data. So <clears throat> just as a sort of a, we're, we're in the home stretch here. Uh, just to give you a sort of an overview of all the things that can go into the value constraint on a triple um, on a triple pattern or a triple constraint rather. Uh, if you want to say anything goes, you can put the dot there. It means I don't care what's there. We saw lots of examples of that. If you want to say I want to specify the data type, you could say I want, for instance, XSD string, and that says that. Uh, or you know, suppose it came in with it was a, a date. Um, it would be expecting quote two thousand eighteen zero five twenty two t zero five eighteen thirty three end quote hat hat XSD date or date time. And so 
date uh, when you put it right down to data type, you're expecting the data to have exact to be annotated with exactly that data type. This works especially well with JSON LD because the at context will in fact provide most of those. Usually, the, the at context provides those data types. Now, then we can also have XML schema facets, which I'll describe in the next slide. And then there are node kinds, which are IRI, blank node, literal, and then non-literal, which stands for IRI or blank node. Now, you could actually, anytime you see non-literal, you could just write open parentheses, IRI, or B node, close parentheses, but non-literal is a little quicker and easier for people to understand. Value sets, here we've got a value set of two, um, male and female, but you can have value sets uh, that are arbitrarily large. You don't have to have complete enumeration of them. You can say anything that starts with this string. It could be literals or it could be IRIs. You can also enumerate by language tags. And then the last one is different from all of these because it doesn't examine the value at all. Instead, it examines the neighborhood around that value, and that's when you've got a reference to another shape. So quickly looking at the uh, data types, the facet on, facets on data types, the top row, min exclusion, max exclusion, uh, sorry, min inclusive, max inclusive, min exclusive, max exclusive, are the ones, are the XML schema uh, constraints, uh, uh, sorry, um, facets that apply to the actual value, the, like the numeric value of something. So if you give it, uh, <clears throat> if you give it, if it's expecting a max value of 10, and you give it 1.1e1, it will say, oh, you've got, you've given, given me 11. I know that value is 11. That's bigger than 10, so you reach, so it rejects it. And that, and there, it's actually doing actual uh, analysis. It, it's parsing it to be a, a, a computation, a computable value. For the total digits, fractions, digits, length, et cetera, pattern, there, it's just a lexical operation. You might think that total digits or fraction digits would be dealing with a value, but no, it's, it's simply some, uh, some string operations that happen to be uh, performed on decimal numbers. The last one, re uh, regular expression pattern, is a, uh, just an XML schema regular expression, which is like the Perl compatible regular expression language um, with implicit anchoring. No explicit anchoring, so you need to put caret and dollar sign if you want to anchor. And uh, we're on the last slide. So um, despite my attempts to sound like uh, a cranky and ornery person, Tom believes that we have an active and friendly development uh, community. And that, uh, and so it's a easy place for people to come in and participate if they have use cases, if they have ideas about how the language should go, if they want to bring up new issues and say, well, you know, this is pretty, this, this doesn't really make, this doesn't make intuitive sense this way. Now, there'll be a limited amount we can fix things if they're not, um, if you don't like how exactly how it's um, defined, because we have to maintain backward compatibility. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't address most use cases by extending the language. We have about, 20 different things that we're planning to add to the language over the next few versions. There are three or so that are going into the, that are in the, what we call the 2.next branch, which is going to be 2.1 in uh, the near future. And that includes import, where import is, uh, it gives you round tripping through imports, so it's not like it gets confused about what you imported what, what, about what the original sch importing schema was versus what the what was imported. It actually keeps track of all that stuff for you. There's inheritance. So if you want to do extensible shapes and you want to say this one extends this one, other one, which is to say it adds more property constraints to it. Or if you want to say this one restricts another one, which is which means it takes the existing property constraints and whittles them down to be more, uh, more uh, discerning. Um, that's in, in the 2.1 branch. And then um, a couple minor things like comments, uh, adding extra, adding slash asterisks, asterisk slash kind of comments to make it easier to, to edit and debug these things. Um, I think that's it. Uh, questions? Hit me.
Can anybody hear me? Yes, I can. Um, Anna, please. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> Phew. I had a moment believing that I had just spoken the last for the last th uh, 20 minutes without being heard. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Tom. I have some now. Thank you for this such a uh, interesting webinar. Uh, I think we needed this for so much long, uh, and um, uh, I, I hope the audience has questions. Uh, while uh, our participants don't put the questions, I'm going to ask you some things. Um, how do this? Um, how do? How does this relate to DCMI application profiles? Uh, Tom, do you want that one or should I take it? Uh, I can I can have a shot at it and then you can correct me. Um, <laughs> Unlikely. You, so an application profile um, takes a number of, of known vocabularies, uh, existing vocabularies, and it, and it um, describes the what the data should look like. Um, so what properties you're using to describe what kinds of things um, and it, it's describing the constraints that you use so you might say um, in my data we have books and authors an author has a first name and a last name a book has exactly one title and it must have a publication date that sort of thing and these these sorts of constraints then are um, can be expressed in RDF data, and um, until the development of RDF validation technologies, um, it was uh, difficult to um, to actually just simply validate the data to to see whether it matches the um, the expected um, shape of the data that um, that you've expressed in your application profile. So uh, essentially, Shex um, uh, provides a language for expressing an application profile in a way that you can use to validate your data and to report uh, any irregularities or any errors in your data uh, with respect to your um, to what you expect to um, to have in your data. Uh, Eric, can you improve on that? Oh well, I just actually want to say that um, that when we were designing Shex, we had this notion of making it easier on the user by saying if they have like for instance multiple type arcs that uh, they just list them. They don't have to do something uh, complex to say, here's what happens on the first one, and here's what happens on the second one. They just look at. They can look at them in isolation, and that uh, that the Dublin Core, um, some work by uh, on Dublin Core application profiles, vindicated that because they had said that was one of the big uh, limitations they'd found in the various things, various ways they were trying to Im implement. Um, act uh, DSP, and so uh, it was nice to see that something that we had created uh, speculatively as being, you know, something we'd seen from our use cases being important was also very important in the uh, Dublin Core uh, application profile space. I, I would just like to add a little bit to that, uh, and I think that it's important also to think about application profiles as being views on data. So you have, just suppose you have a pile of data and you know it's about, um, you know it's about books and you, but it's, the data has come from many different sources and, and so maybe it doesn't uh, completely align. Um, you have a lot of overlap, but it's kind of messy. Um, and in an application profile, in a Shex schema, you can you can um, you can write a Shex schema which will take a very um, 
a very strict view of that data and report um, things that are missing or errors. Or you can write a check schema that um, takes a very tolerant view and um, and and you can have two different types of of schemas depending on whether you are creating the data in which case you want it to be very strict and you want your own data to be very complete and very very clean um, as opposed to a schema which is is checking data that's coming in where you want it to be more tolerant because you know that there's a lot of variation out there. And so um, the idea is that um, what you put into your schema um, really depends on requirements and that it's not, and that you can have more than one um, check schema uh, to describe a given set of data depending on on the uses that you're going to uh, make of the validation okay thank you we have already uh, some questions here i'm going to read them out loud for you uh one question from uh, david maus that is can you explain the difference to shackle in a nutshell when should i use checks instead of shackle and vice versa. So, yeah, Shackle and Shex have sort of different, they came in with different design criteria. Uh, Shackle was designed with the notion of, of basically a, a way of using spin rules to validate uh, data, uh, whereas Shex came in with the notion of, let's start from a greenfield and invent a language that's going to be as easy for you, uh, users as possible. So, in Shackle, you have uh, Shex basically works a little harder to try and make it easy for you to understand things, uh, to make it easier for to, for for a user to express things. So, for instance, when that when I was talking about the repeated properties, uh, also closed shapes are much easier in um, in Shex because in Shackle, it's kind of a weak implementation because you have to say. Um, uh, here are the no, here are the the predicates over which I I I don't want to I don't consider it closed, and so it's it's uh, it means you end up doing a lot of work you end up acting as a compiler when you're building the, the schema. Uh, the advantage to Shackle and, and another place that you really want to watch out for in Shackle is they have a one of operator as well, but it doesn't behave as you might expect. For instance, if you say I want a name or a given name and a family name. It will not reject if you've got uh, Dave with a name of Dave, folk name of Dave Smith, and a folk family name of Jones. So uh, the places where Shackle is an advantage has it, uh, are, is it's more useful to you is a if you're already using Spin anyway, it's probably going to be useful to you. Uh, B um, if you are uh, if you are trying to um, uh, express your, if you want to use its extensibility mechanism. Now, there aren't a lot of implementations of Shackle, but in principle, if there were, um, if there were many implementations, you should be able to use its extensibility mechanism to write extensions in one app, in one implementation of it, and have them automatically work in another implementation of it, provided those were within the range of its, of its extensibility mechanism. Uh, and then the last part for Shex's extensibility mechanism, the they're not designed. There isn't sort of a, a sub language for de, from creating extension, extensi, uh, extensions. It's basically you define the semantics of the extensions, and whoever wants to implement it implement it implements it. There are some extensions that are already um, getting some uh, that are that are being implemented by all of them just because they are used for testing. Uh, and then there are a couple of extensions that are starting to be deployed for fun things like schema mapping, et cetera. Okay, oh, I would also say um, mm -hmm. another another place the the Shackle language was really designed with an RDF syn syntax, mm -hmm. uh, and so they have a sort of proposal for a compact syntax, but it uh, they don't have 
tests. And, and honestly, it took, it took about two and a half years of concerted effort to nail down the round tripping and everything like that between the Shex C and Shex J and Shex R. So um, it would take a while for Shackle to get its compact syntax to be um, to be as mature as the Shex one. Thank you, Eric. Another question from Chris Ulz. Um, I noticed the pre-step mentioned earlier. How do we find examples of the of the steps others have taken to use as examples as model for our own data data so there's a um, there's a site so there, there are a bunch of model examples in the schema and in the spec um, I can actually just go show those off uh, let's see Squiggle T Shex .io. go 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 so, sorry, not in the schema, I meant the primer. So the primer has a bunch of examples in it, um, and you'll see that they, you can try it, you can click try it on them, and they will take you off to one of a couple of different implementations that have web interfaces to, to see what, how, whether it worked, you know, how, what, you know why, something be, why something validated or why something else didn't validate. So you get some examples, you get some ideas from, from all the try it links in here, uh, and then, there are also ones in the spec, and then there's another place you can go, which is if you go to uh, github.com slash expec slash schemas. There's a sort of a clearinghouse place where people just store their, their schemas in, um, in here so that uh, people can, you know, steal them and extend them and improve them, et cetera. Very nice. Thank you. Oh, there's actually, there's also examples in the RDF mm -hmm. book, the validating RDF book, um, which actually I might not have shown a picture, uh, shown a reference, should in fact uh, mention that it exists. There, oh yeah, that's right. This validating RDF book has a, um, has a chapter on checks and it has lots of examples. And there's also a site validating RDF book that has all of those examples as well. Thank you, Eric. I have a question for you, uh, myself. I am not sure if you talked about this, but uh, I want to ask it anyway, that is. Um, do, do the tools that implement checks validate the properties against a given namespace schema or validate the terms of uh, control vocabulary? Or is it, are they supposed to do this or not? So there's, um, for small controlled vocabularies, it's easy to do that because you can just enumerate them. So for instance, if you wanted to say that I've got, uh, that something has to be in this value set, it's easy to write that. Um, and if you have a set, a small number of properties, you know, no, like a reasonable number of properties. In fact, to be honest, I've never seen something that was too large to express in, in checks in terms of properties because schemas that get that large nobody really wants to work with anyway. So, but what there are not, this is, this is something that exists in I think the, the LEAL implementation, but it's not in the Java implementation, but it's not yet part of the standard. Uh, there is the ability to do um, rules that where your triple constraints don't require a full predicate, but instead just require a predicate stem. So you can say anything starting with mm -hmm. this, uh, can you know uh, and frequent a frequent use of this is to say um, to say i I accept the following things from this namespace and no others uh, and that will typically be typically be you know the, the namespace that your application logic works in okay thank you very much I don't think we we have yes we don't have more questions so um, we will close the webinar. Thank you both. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Tom. Um, and uh, let me tell the audience that um, the, 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 the recording of this uh, webinar will be available to the participants. And uh, in some weeks, they will be available in the DCMI YouTube channel. 
Thank you all. And in June, we have two more webinars. See you in June. Thank you very much. And Thank thanks you. for all your attention. Thank you, Eric and Tom um, from ACES. For everyone still here, a recording of the webinar and the PDF copy of today's slides will be made available within 48 hours of today's broadcast. So please look in your inboxes for a follow-up email with the links to the recording and the PDF of today's slides. Thank you and have a great day. You as well. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.